All right? So what I'm going to do is give you a basic background on climate change and global warming, because the whole thing we are doing here is about reducing the effect of global warming, re reduce the effect of climate change, but you must have that idea. So tomorrow, if you go to work, and then you say, why do you want to do renewable energy? What is the, why, why do you want to remove the diesel generators? Why do you want to bring in solar? You should have answers for that, all right? So, just want to start, give you basic background. Everyone knows these pictures, and you have seen these kind of pictures. And these are the pictures we show outside when we go away from Pacific Island countries. And we see that these things are right at the footstep. When we talk about sea level rise, we talk about climate change. There are things happening in the, around the Pacific. You don't have to go very far, right? So think about it. If somebody asks you, what is the difference between weather and climate change? See, at the moment, you, you see the weather is kind of funny. Some places it is very, very cold. If you go to the US or go to the Europe side, it is much, much colder than before. There are some places where temperature going to minus 30, minus 40 degrees. And this is kind of, some, then uh, the, the President Trump would say, oh, what global warming, the people are freezing, it's minus 40, right? But then some places, the temperatures are going, if you go to Melbourne, if you go to the Southern Australia, the temperatures are hitting very, very high, right? So what is happening is, the weather patterns are changing. They are not normal. 2016 was one of the hottest year in, the, in, the, in history. So weather and climate, these are two things. So if I ask you what is the difference between weather and climate, what, do, what would you answer? Weather and climate. The answer is somewhere there, isn't it? The weather is basically, we're talking about the short term. Short term, isn't it? And climate, whenever we talk about climate, we're talking about a longer term. So weather could, be, could vary from day to day, from week to week, isn't it? But when we're talking about the climate changes and all that, it does not happen overnight. It happens over a number of years. So whenever we're talking about climate change, somebody says, no, it's been very cold. What do you talk about? Why are you talking about global warming? That your answer should be, it is not one day. You have to look at the large, long range. You look at in terms of months and years and tens of years, right? So if, if that is agreed, what is driving our climate? What is the basic driver of all the weather phenomena, all the climate phenomena that, that are happening around the world? Is the sun, again, remember yesterday we talked about sun being the driver of all the energy systems we have, but sun is also the driver of, so when you have cyclones coming in, when you have, you know, uh, wind, high wind coming in, it's the sun. Sun is the basic driver. And you can see all these processes. So I would, what I would like you to do, we won't spend much time on this, but I would like you to do is to go back home and open this uh, power, PowerPoint and look at these different components of weather. All right, and that will give you some idea of the weather and climate. So remember, long-term weather is the climate. We're talking about various processes that affect. The climate change is large, lo long-range changes in weather. So everything is coming from the sun, as I said. You could see that this is the Earth's radiation energy balance. All our energy comes from the sun. As the energy comes in, I'll be talking about more about this thing. On the right-hand side, near that circle, I've written greenhouse effect, greenhouse gases. I'll be talking more about that one. But you could see that this yellow, broad yellow line, that is the incoming solar radiation. As the solar radiation comes in, what happens? Some of it is reflected by the clouds. Some of it is reflected by the, the, the atmosphere, isn't it? Some of it is reflected by the ground. But then, some of it is, by, is absorbed by the, the ground. So the heat is absorbed by the surface, by the sea, by the trees. And when that heat is absorbed, some of it is re-radiated. We'll come back to this point again. What happens when something gets hot? Everyone has learned about black body radiation. Do you remember black body radiation? What does it say? Anybody at a temperature greater than 0K would emit radiation, isn't it? So Earth also gets hot and it starts emitting radiation. And that radiation is sent back to the atmosphere. So this process is happening all the time. The sun comes up, the sun heats up the Earth, the Earth gets a higher temperature, the Earth would start radiating back, isn't it? 
So these are the processes that are happening. So when we say energy balance, we're talking about what is the energy coming in and what is the energy going out. All right, some of the mechanical engineering people will be talking about heat transfer in electrical and all, all the physics, you, you talk about energy balance, heat in, heat out, energy in, energy out. So this is what we are talking about. So all our climate phenomena, all our weather phenomena is basically going around this, energy coming from the sun, all right? What happens is, as I said, the light comes from the, or the energy comes from the sun. As the energy comes in, the earth's surface absorbs it. After it absorbs it, the temperature goes up. And as the temperature goes up, it starts emitting the radiation. Now what happens if you do not have anything, if, did not, if we did not have any atmosphere, what would happen? If we did not have an atmosphere, what would happen to this? So the yellow line, the yellow line is the incoming radiation. The red line is the outgoing radiation. Why does it look red? Because the emitted radiation is in infrared. Remember, you can calculate. I'll show you the equations, but you have done in pH 1 or 2. In fact, most of the concepts that we'll come across in this course, those concepts are basic physics concepts which you have come across in your, you know, pH 102, 101, all right? So if you, if you are okay with those concepts, you will find that this course is not very difficult. So as the solar radiation comes in, which is basically visible, mainly visible part, we'll show you later on, but the emitted radiation from the ground is in the infrared. What is infrared? Infrared is the heat, isn't it? Infrared is heat. So that heat is being emitted if there was no atmosphere, what would happen? The heat will be lost into the space. So energy comes in from the sun and earth gets heated up and it removes, it sends all the heat up to the atmosphere. At the end of the day, in fact, the earth would be a very, very cold place. We'll do the calculations as part of your tutorial. The temperature of the earth Average temperature would have been minus 15 degrees centigrade or minus 18 degrees centigrade. Average. Even here, it would have been minus 18, 20 degrees centigrade. If there was no atmosphere. But Earth is clever. Nothing would have, nothing would have survived if it was like that. If you go to moon, does the moon have an atmosphere? Moon does not have any atmosphere, isn't it? So if you go to the dark side of moon, the temperatures can go to very, very low. Nobody can survive there. Because what happens during the daytime, it heats up, and then it emits all the radiation, and it disappears. So what happens when you feel cold? Anytime you feel cold, what would you do? You take a blanket, let's say, isn't it? So Earth needed a blanket. Because with minus 15, minus 18 degrees centigrade, nothing could survive. So nature, nature plays a role there. And to build life here, we needed a blanket. So what kind of blanket would we have? Nature brings a blanket of a gas. A gas which will trap all this infrared radiation, the heat from going out. So that gas is carbon dioxide. That gas is methane. That gas is nitrous oxide. So mainly carbon dioxide. So that gas, what happens was there were volcanoes. The gas also came out from the sea. And that gas formed a layer. All right? A layer around the atmosphere. So that, what did that, that layer do? It trapped the, trapped the radiation. So what is happening here, this is the carbon dioxide molecule here. You can see this is the carbon dioxide molecule here now. Solar radiation comes in. Earth gets heated up. Infrared goes up. If there was no carbon dioxide, then it would have gone into the space. But because there's carbon dioxide, it traps the infrared. It traps, and after some time, after some time, re-radiates. Re-radiates that infrared. So the carbon dioxide molecule traps the infrared, and after some time, re-radiates the infrared. That re-radiated re infrared arrives back to Earth. So what we mean to say, because we have a blanket now, 
not all the infrared can leave, but some of it is trapped. And that infrared, what do you find interesting here? Or amusing? So if you have this layer of gas, it will trap the infrared and it will send it back to the Earth. So from minus 15 degrees centigrade, you can come to about plus 15 degrees centigrade. This is what it does. That layer of infrared, uh, the layer of the gas, carbon dioxide, it traps the infrared radiation and it keeps the temperature to a comfortable 15 degrees centigrade. So you understand the greenhouse, this effect is called the greenhouse effect. When I say greenhouse effect, what does it mean? It means that the layer of gas which trap the, the infrared radiation and re-radiate it back to the Earth. It is like having a blanket around the Earth. The only thing it is a transparent blanket. It allows the visible light to, comes in, to come in, but it traps all the infrared from leaving. Not all, but part of it. Is it all right? And this is what, what was happening, and this is how the temperature became average, about 15 degrees centigrade, very comfortable, and this is when the life started building up because we needed a temperature which was suitable for life. Is it okay? So you would say, all right, greenhouse gases, if somebody says we should remove all the greenhouse gases, that is not right. If you remove all the greenhouse gases, then nobody can survive because the temperature will plunge down to minus 15. So you needed some. But now what happens? You're feeling cold. You get a blanket, you're feeling comfortable. Now, you get greedy and you get another blanket. You start feeling slightly better. But then one more blanket. Then you start feeling hot and hotter as you're getting more and more blanket. You have a choice, you can remove the blanket. But here what is happening, every time we burn one liter of fossil fuel, we get about 2.5 kilos of carbon dioxide. Every time I run my car, and I use one liter of petrol, I get about 2.4 kilograms of carbon dioxide. That carbon dioxide goes up in the atmosphere. Everyone is running these generators, all these cars are running, all of them are sending these 2.4 liters per liter. All that carbon dioxide is being deposited. Some of it is absorbed by the trees. What do the trees do? They take the carbon dioxide, and they take water and make it carbohydrates, that's the food, and in the return, they also give you oxygen, isn't it? That is why forests are very, very important. What is the importance of forests? The forest trees, because they take this carbon dioxide, they take water, they convert it into carbohydrate, the, the food that we eat, and at the same time, they also give us oxygen. So forests are very important. So what I was trying to say is, every time we burn this fossil fuel, we are adding a one more blanket, one more blanket to the atmosphere. And because the blankets are thicker and thicker, more and more, more infrared is being trapped. And if more and more infrared is being trapped, the temperature is bound to go up. So this is the basis when we say global warming, this is what is happening. Because we are burning fossil fuels, because we are adding carbon dioxide to the, the envelope or the blanket, so that is why the temperature will increase. It's about 95%, 97% that this is the main cause of global warming. All right? So if you want to reduce the global warming, if you want to make the Earth comfortable again, we have to cut down the, the carbon dioxide. And it's not only carbon dioxide. It's methane, it's nitrous oxide, and there's some other gases which I'll show you now. Okay? So every time you cut down one liter of diesel, you have cut down about 2.5 kilos of carbon dioxide. So you can think of the atmosphere like this. You can think of the atmosphere like a tub. And every year, what we are doing is we are adding carbon dioxide and all these greenhouse gases into this tub. You understand? So what is happening glacial time up when the earth was very, very cold, the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere was about 180 parts per million. Gases are measured in parts per million. 
So 180 parts per million. Then we came to the pre-industrial time. Pre-industrial time means before about 1750, before the you know, fossil fuels were started being used, before the engines and locomotives and all these things came into being. The temperature, uh, the, the amount of gas in the atmosphere is there. You can see that the pre-industrial time. Now what is happening today? This is slightly older. In fact, we crossed 400 some time back last year. Today, in the atmosphere, it is more than 400 parts per million. So when I was talking about the adding the blankets, we, are, we already added so many blankets that it has gone from 180 to 400. And if we are not careful, then we are adding every day. Yesterday, I showed you about 70% of our energy or 70% electricity production is coming from fossil fuels. So every time we are running generator, we are adding to this top. Is it okay? Does it make sense to you that why we should be cutting down the use of fossil fuel? Because we are filling this tub with the greenhouse gases. So every year, already there is about 800 billion tons of carbon. When I say carbon, carbon dioxide in the form of carbon dioxide, it is in the atmosphere. Every year, we send about 8 billion tons. The way we are using fossil fuels at the moment, we send in about 8 billion tons. Out of that 8 billion tons, the ocean. Now this is where again, the Pacific Island countries and ocean countries become very important. They have a large amount of ocean there and that ocean is playing a very, very important role. That ocean absorbs about 2 billion tons of carbon dioxide, which is being emitted by all the different, different uh, countries and different sources. Two billion ton on the other side goes to the land biosphere. When I say land biosphere, I'm talking about the trees and forests and all that. That is why they're very important. So four billion tons has been absorbed. But the, la the next four billion has nowhere to go. And that is the four billion which is being added to the atmosphere every year. And that is the one. So when I say blanket, that was kind of a metaphor for it. The blanket is this 4 billion tons, which is being added every year. And if you don't do anything, then we are make, making that, uh, that blanket thicker and thicker. Is it okay? So we have to do something to cut down this. So this is why everyone, the COP21 or COP23 and all these meetings, everyone is basically talking about how to cut down this going into the atmosphere. And you can see that uh, the amount of carbon dioxide is increasing every year. You can, as I was talking about, this is the time when the industrial revolution started. And you can see that different, you know, petroleum and coal and natural gas and cement production, all of them are adding up. And this is the million tons of carbon which is being added every year. You can see that this is up to 2000, but if you go to 2018, this thing has gone up very high. I would like you to look at the IPCC reports, just go on the internet and look for this intergovernmental panel on climate change and you would see their latest reports, okay? And because we said the temperature is increasing, so uh, because the, the blanket is increasing thickness, so the temperature is increasing. And you could see that from 1750, the temperature is keep in, keeps increasing. And the, 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 the worry is, if we do not do anything, then the temperature will keep increasing and it so the effort right now, everyone is working towards that. How do we control that the temperature does not go beyond two degrees from that time? Higher than two degrees. Because what will happen if the temperature increases? What are the effects? One is, of course, the glaciers will melt, isn't it? Every day we hear about the glaciers melting. All right. So what happens to the ocean? What happens to water when, it, when the temperature increases? The water expands, isn't it? As the water expands, so the sea level will rise. So every time the, the temperature changes by a small amount, the water will expand. And that is where the sea level rise will start coming in. So the increase in temperature, in fact, the Pacific Island countries are saying it should not go beyond 1.5 degrees centigrade. So in fact, there is a movement, even COP23, I'm sure if you are keeping track, everyone was talking about 1.5 degrees centigrade. While globally, people say, okay, two degrees, but we know that even 1.5 degrees centigrade is very, very important. And the whole idea is 
To keep it below 1.5 degrees centigrade, only then these countries, the smaller countries, most of the Pacific Island countries are facing this danger. Imagine the sea level go rising by a small amount. Kiribati and you know, Kiribati, lots of other countries, they have this job, right? So it's very important we control this somehow. What are the greenhouse gases? These are the main, main greenhouse gases. Although we put everything together, we say carbon dioxide, but carbon dioxide is the main one, and it's the most benign one. In fact, they are more dangerous. Methane, which is 21 times, we define them in terms of global warming potential. These greenhouse gases are defined in terms of a term called global warming potential. Because once these gases go into the atmosphere, they stay in the atmosphere for some time. So based on that, and based on their activity, we define them as in their global warming potential. Carbon dioxide, as I said, is benign. It's everywhere. It is the most uh, common. It is given a global warming potential of one. Methane has a global warming potential of 21 times of carbon dioxide. So one kilo of methane is equal to 23, 21 times of carbon dioxide more dangerous, all right? Uh, nitrous oxide is almost 300 times dangerous than carbon dioxide. And then g gases like HFCs and PFCs and SF6. SF6 is 24,000 times. One kilo of SFC is like 24,000 kilos of carbon dioxide. So these are the gases which have to be reduced, all right? But most common, most, most common is carbon dioxide, as I said and methane, of course. So these are the two things that we can look after very quickly, and a lot of work is being done. So when we cut down the fossil fuel, we are cutting down methane, we are cutting down uh, uh, basically carbon dioxide and nitrous oxide. These are the two the main ones that we can cut. But the six gases are these. Whenever we reduce a carbon dioxide of one ton, we say it is certified emission reduction. From different sectors, where is these em emissions coming from? You can see electricity sector plays a very large role. Almost 25% is coming from this carbon. Remember yesterday I showed you about 70% of the electricity was being produced by uh, fossil fuels, isn't it? So the electricity is playing a very big role in producing this carbon dioxide and the greenhouse gases. So transport, again, transport is a big, big player here. Buildings do emit. Industry, all these are the primary sources. These are the secondary ones, indirect, but these are the primary sources where, so you can see there's a lot of potential here because this course we are mainly talking about electricity. So you can see there's a huge scope. So every time I talk about a renewable energy resource, if you can replace one liter of carbon, one liter of fossil fuel, you are making a difference, right? Every time you replace a kerosene lamp at home, and bring in a solar light, you make a difference. So that is a small difference, but it does make a difference. If you add it up, there is a huge amount. As I told you, the carbon dioxide levels, you can see that they're increasing and increasing, and they almost hit last year. In 2017, it's going up to 408 parts per million. Okay? This place uh, uh, where they measure uh, South Pole carbon dioxide levels, they reach 400 parts per million. First time in four million years. So the temperatures are increasing. I could show you. Uh, you can see the, how the temperatures are increasing over the years. This is 1.5 degrees above the, the base level. This is 2. degrees, 2 degrees. And you can see that the way it is increasing, the rates are increased now, and we have reached here. So in fact, we have a very little time left before we hit the 1.5 degrees centigrade, and after that, 2 degrees centigrade. So if we do not do anything, then we are going to hit that, the crucial level. And as we increase the temperature, you can see that what is going to happen to the sea level warming, sea level rise, and um, uh, glaciers, and all these kind of things. You, know, you can see the Arctic is turning green. It is supposed to be all ice. Sea level is rising. And you can see that there are different models. And you said 
high emissions, the sea level will rise almost one meter. So one meter is this much. So you can imagine all these coastal houses, coastal villages, some of them will disappear, right? It can go even higher. And if it's very low emissions, even then they'll go up to 60 centimeters. And you can see that. You can have this IPCC report. I would like you to go on the IPCC report AR5. That is the latest one. And you could see what, what is happening. Okay, so it is a good idea if you are doing a renewable energy course, you must understand why you are doing this and you should be able to explain why we should be moving towards a renewable energy future. You can see Solomon Islands and the five islands disappeared recently. Between 1947 and 2014, five of them, they completely disappeared. In Papua New Guinea also, about four or five islands completely disappeared and people had to move to mainland. So it is happening around us. It is not very foreign. You can see the, these islands, some of our students coming from Solomon Islands would know about this, so some of the islands disappear. All right, so it's very real. Everyone is saying two degrees centigrade. Pacific Islands say, and some of the, lots of countries are saying 1.5 degrees centigrade target. Only then we'll be able to reduce, and that can only be done if we reduce our greenhouse gas emission. Remember. If we don't, then we'll be going in this scale. We'll be increasing our greenhouse gases. So we go this way, the temperature would be increasing. But we have to reduce it. We have to reduce it. Only then we can control the temperature increase. Is it okay? Any question on this? Any, any, anything that you want to know about global warming and how renewable energy can play a role in this? Are you, are, you, are you convinced that renewable energy is important in two things? Number one, it can bring in electricity to places, remote places. Again, I'm going to talk about this. And second thing is, it can cut down the greenhouse gas emission and it can help reduce the global warming. Now, in 2015, the United Nations, all, all the countries around the world, they came together. And they said, we have to move towards a sustainable development. Everyone has to come to the same level of development. So what are the things? What are the goals? There are 17 goals. Again, I would like you to check it up. There are 17 goals. We call them SDGs. 17 SDGs. 17 goals. And you can read them from 1 to 17. The first one is no poverty. Everyone has a minimum level of living. No poverty in the world. Number two would be no hunger. All these things, right? No, clean water. Number, number six, you can see that everyone should have clean water and sanitation. At this, in this course, we're talking about number seven. What is number seven? SDG seven. It says affordable electricity. Affordable and sustainable electricity. In, uh, electricity to all. Energy for all. When I say energy, it includes electricity. It includes cooking and all those things. Electricity alone is not energy, isn't it? because the energy for transport, energy for electricity, and all that. So affordable energy. So SDG 7. Now, important thing with SDG 7, because we work with SDG 7, so we want to show if you have energy, if you have sustainable energy, you can get lots of other SDGs uh, satisfied. If you have access to electricity, it means that you can clean your water. So number 6 can be satisfied. If you have electricity, you can uh, do some business. It means that the good work, you know, decent work, number eight is satisfied. If you have electricity, you can have your hospitals where you can keep vaccines and all that uh, preserved properly. It means good health. If you have electricity, then you have children not studying with kerosene lamp at night, but they have good lighting so that they can study late time. So electricity alone or energy, good energy can satisfy a number of so I can ask you this question, and I would like you to research and learn about it. Why energy is important? Why should we, why SDG 7 is important in achieving all these goals? See, at the end of the day, when you do this course, you, do, you finish your uh, engineering and physics and all that, ultimately you are going to go to work. Some of you, you are going to work for government. And these are the challenges you are going to see there. And these are the things, even in the company, private companies, you're going to see these kind of challenges. And you have to find ways. And so you have to look at, what can I do? What, what, what have I learned in my school? 
or in college that I can use my knowledge to satisfy these things. So it's very important that you look beyond passing the course, any course you are doing here, passing the course and just doing the examination. Think of what, what are the implications of learning. So SDG 7 is very, very important, right? This is the main driver for climate change. You can see that. This is climate action, number 13. OK? When I say reduce inequalities, why? Because if you go to the villages, you find that women are the women do, do most of the work. They go out and walk for maybe five hours to bring wood for cooking because they do not have any other way to cook, right? So if you have that, then you can reduce, reduce that kind of work, and they can spend their time in useful other things. Gender equality, bring all the genders together. It will happen if they have access to work, if they have access to energy. So all these things are very, very important. I would like you to read this and maybe write a short note on this. In the Pacific, we call this, you have, you have heard of dilemma, we call this trilemma. What is trilemma? There are three things which are affecting the Pacific Island countries. What are the three things? Number one is extreme dependence on fossil fuels. If you go to many countries, especially in Polynesia, if you go to Nauru, you go to Kiribati, you go to Samoa, you, uh, you go to Tonga, electricity access is almost 100%. 95% people have electricity or 99% people have electricity. But then you ask them, where do you get your electricity from? How do you generate the electricity? And you find that most of the places it is fossil fuel. And where are those fossil fuels coming from? They're coming from all the way from Dubai and Abu Dhabi and Middle East and all these places. Anything happens that side is a big impact on these countries. So extreme dependence, very, very high dependence, a sudden change in a war breaks out in the Middle East, these countries are going to be affected. All the Pacific Island countries are going to be affected. So it's very extreme. So this is energy security is very dicey thing here. Energy equity, 70% of people in the Pacific. Again, you would say, okay, Polynesia side is almost 100%. But if you go to Papua New Guinea, as I told you yesterday, only 15% people have electricity. Solomon Island, Vanuatu, they would be slightly better. But then big Melanesian countries have a challenge where almost 70% people are without electricity. So this is challenge number two. And number three, of course, the climate change, which is everyone is facing. So these are the three things which all these Pacific Island countries are facing all the time. And what can, what can help in reducing this? I put SDG 7 in the middle. We have just talked about this, that SDG 7, bringing in the affordable electricity. The moment you have solar energy coming in, you are not dependent on the fossil fuel. If you produce your electricity using the local energy, solar energy, nobody can stop you from using that electricity. Whether there is a war or whether there is a stoppage of fossil fuel coming in. And that is why most or more countries are going towards that. 70% people, they are very far off. In Papua New Guinea, again, I give you an example. I lived there for many years, so that's why I keep talking about Papua New Guinea. People live on, it's a very large country, a lot of big population, 7 million people, but people live very far off. There is no way that you can take the grid to them because they are very scattered. It is not economically viable. So what can you do? The only way to provide electricity to them is to build the small systems, renewable energy-based systems that can provide electricity. In Fiji, we have about 100 islands where people live. Those islands cannot be connected to the grid. So what is the way out? They have to have their own system. In Fiji, there are about 600 diesel systems. But those diesel systems are, again, not secure. So we replace those diesel systems with PV-based systems or wind energy-based system or biomass-based system, does not matter. But as long as we have some local resource, a coconut oil, oil-based system, and use that. So, this is the only way we can affordable electricity. This, this is an example which I usually give. We think that people are poor. That is why they use kerosene lamps. That is why they use candle lamps, candles and all that. But you find that, in fact, they are paying the highest. I would like you to look at this, not here, when you home. Look at this 
graph carefully, you'll find that when you buy a candle or when you buy a kerosene, the initial cost is very small. But they have to buy the They get a very small amount left from that. So if you measure, if you measure that amount of energy they get per, per dollar, you find that their cost is the highest. Their cost is the highest. So in fact, they are paying hundreds of times of what we are paying. Their initial cost is low, but the amount they pay per kilowatt hour is the highest. If we say, oh, these guys are poor, they can't afford, that's why they are buying this kerosene lamp and all that. But no, they are not buying this because they are poor in the sense of not being aware. They do not know that there are other things available. If you go and show them that there are solar lights available where they spend $20 a day, $20 once, and after that the light is free for them, you know, for the next two, three years. So it is possible. These people are not poor because they don't have capability to pay. They are poor because there is no information. So we call this energy poverty. Not poverty in the sense of money. They have the money to buy because they buy kerosene. They buy candles. But then our job, your job is when you go back home, you have to make sure that talk to people. You see people using kerosene lamp and uh, candles and all that. Then you can explain to them. Then they can spend some more money initially and after that, the solar light would give them almost free, free light and free electricity for a long time. Initial expenditure might be high, isn't it? So think about this. You can see the Solomon Islands pay among the highest. They pay almost, almost $1.80. Fijian dollar. We are friends from Solomon Islands. They can tell me. About $1.80 per unit. In Fiji, we pay about 30 cents. So you can imagine 30, 33 cents. In Solomon's, you pay 180 cents for each unit of electricity. Now, this is not affordable. We can bring solar and other renewable energy sources and can, can reduce this. They spend a huge amount of their monthly income just on electricity. A small amount of electricity, 30 units a month, but they spend a lot of money on that. So they're not poor because of they are not being able to pay. They are poor because we are not able to provide them the right kind of electricity, affordable electricity. So this is a job, again, you electrical engineers, mechanical engineers, physics people, you, this, is the, this is the duty you have, that you think about it. When you talk about designing new systems, you think about designing new systems where you can cut down these things. That would be the practical application of this course. Passing the course is not a problem. I hardly fail anyone. But if you, something comes out, useful come out, comes out of this course, that would be, you know, that, that would make me happy. <coughs> so we were still talking about climate change and COP21 in France, it happened. And uh, all the countries came together and they said, every, all the countries have a responsibility. All the countries have decided to reduce their emission and increase the renewable energy. So you can see again, when you go back to your countries, you'll find that if you work for the government, you'll find that each government has a target. Each government, Tuvalu is saying 100% renewable energy-based electricity by 2020. Energy efficiency by 30%. Tonga is 70%. Samoa is 100% renewable energy. Fiji is going 30% reduction. And FEA says 99% from uh, renewable energy. Vanuatu and PNG. So you can see that all these countries have targets now. And where is this coming from? This will come from the renewable energy resources. But to use the renewable energy resources, what these countries need is trained manpower, human power. So most important thing is you people. If you are trained properly, when you go back home or you in Fiji, then you work in this design systems. Because money can't get, can't get you everything. But if you have trained people, that is what is going to happen. So this is the whole idea of doing these courses. Maybe expose you to various possibilities and later on you develop your own ideas. But you help the countries. All the countries are doing this. And they have to. Just to give you some examples now. Solar energy. Few various things it can do. First thing is 
the straightforward electricity access. Various ways. This is a picture from Rotuma. Rotuma has this system of 100 and about 160 kilowatt system. It is a microgrid. We'll talk about these things later on, what is microgrid and mini-grid and all that. But this is a system which is connected to the generator and it has reduced the requirement for the petroleum by a very large amount. So 150 kilowatt. This is supported by a company called UAE from UAE Master. This is an island, Tao Island, in American Samoa. There is this island which is 100% solar. Now you would say, how can it be 100% solar? Because the sun is only during daytime, isn't it? So what do you do? You bring in batteries, storage, isn't it? So Tesla, have you heard of Tesla? You said Tesla, yes. So Tesla has come in here. Did you watch the rocket launch yesterday? Tesla rocket launch? Go back to YouTube, watch their Tesla rocket launch. They do lots of things. But one of the interesting things they do is batteries. So they have brought batteries, and now this island has solar panels, and then they have batteries, and the island has become 100% renewable. Okay? There is another island in um, Tokela. Tokela got, became renewable in maybe 2011 or 12, and they also have three systems with batteries, and this is all completely 100% renewable, 100% re uh, solar. So these are the bigger systems that you can see. As I said, you go in town and you can find grid connected systems even in Fiji. Samoa is doing already 12 megawatt system. Uh, Tonga has almost three, three, four megawatt now. Um, but if you go to the islands in Fiji, this is a picture from Fiji, graph from Fiji, you find that in the remote areas you find small solar home systems. So the Department of Energy does solar home systems. So it is not, does not have to be a large system like this by small solar home systems. Maybe two lights, a radio and security light, that kind of thing. About 9,000 systems are in Fiji at the moment. And the number is increasing. So if you go to Wanwaleu, if you go to uh, Lao Islands, if you go to Yasawa site, you will see all these small home systems. I'm sure some of you have the, uh, these systems at home. So these are about 9,000 systems around and they're increasing, very useful. And then they have very small systems, Pico Solar. This thing costs about $300. We were doing this project, so we went up on Bonvaleu and then very remote area. And these are the small systems. These guys were using small candles, and there's nothing else. So they bought this $300 and they paid in installments. And this thing became their, you know, the, the four lights and all that. So these kind of systems are available. I was showing you the SDGs. We said clean water. This is our project again. And uh, this is Yenuta Island. Now, Yenuta, anybody from Yenuta? Yenuta Island is not very far from, one, from uh, Navua, about 30 minutes boat, yes? But one of the challenges there is there is no water. There is no clean water source. There are about 200 people, but there is no water source. So they all depend on rainwater. If it doesn't rain, then they are in big trouble. If it rains, then it's fine. So what we did, we got this solar thermal system. This is not solar panels. This is a solar thermal system. It basically, we'll talk about these kind of systems later on. It takes in water from here, takes water here, and it evaporates water with solar energy. And as the water evaporates, it leaves the, this is seawater coming in. It evaporates water and desalinated water comes from the other side. So as long as the sun is shining, you have this clean drinking water coming out from this side. No electricity, nothing. And this system can produce about 200 liters of water every day. So these are the kind of, so again, we are satisfying, as I said, we are satisfying from SDG 7, SDG 6, clean water. And because there is clean water, so there is no diarrhea, there is no typhoid. It means that health. So again, another SDG we are satisfying. Some places, they have the, they have the uh, water resource. They have a, uh, what do you call it, a borehole. So this is in, uh, this is in um, near Ba, a village called Namau. This is in uh, Kumbalao. These are all our projects. This is in Kumbala uh, uh, school. Again, they had these uh, boreholes, but they did not have any, any, any uh, generator. They did not have money to buy uh, fuel all the time. So we set up a small 
these are very small systems of one, one kilowatt, 1.2 kilowatt a solar system. And now it's all free electricity and it is coming out and the water is, you know, clean, up, clean water is available. So again, we are satisfying. You can see that health and uh, so SDG 7 playing a very big role. It is not only water and health, it is also income generation. So we, did, we do these kind of projects where we put a solar panel here and then we bring in fridges. So these are small fridges, small uh, freezers, and we take them to remote communities, fishing communities, very remote. I don't know whether you know about Kia, Kia Island, anybody from Kia Island, anybody from Mali Island, anybody from Undu Point, and anybody from Kandavu. So we have, we have done all these, all these projects in these places. I'm sure there are people, yes. But when you go home, go home, you go to Tawuki and you will see. <clears throat> if you go to Mali Island, you go to a village called Vesi. If you go to, if you go to Kia Island, you go to a village called Daku. So all these villages, we have set up these small solar systems and with refrigerators. So what was happening is before, they did not have any storage. So they would throw the, you know, whatever is left, because the fish would go bad, they would throw it away. But now they can store it. And then you can see that most of the time it's women who are doing this. And they are doing things, even making ice cream and ice lollies. And they're selling it. So it's become a business. The children who had never tasted ice cream and ice candies before, now after the school, they would have ice cream ice. So it is not only about, when I, when I talk about energy being for, not only for electricity, it is the whole life changing thing. So never think about, you bring in a solar lamp, it is bringing only light. Light is just a small thing. But with light, what do you do? You look at this, this is in Tonga. And they are, they are weaving at night. So there is income generation. So it's a whole story. You can write a whole book about these things. And this is the benefit of learning about renewable energy. This is what I say. And then coming days, uh, in, your, you know, in 10 years time, all of you will be driving electric vehicles. There is a big, big, this is in Tonga, you see. Anybody from Tonga here? These are the tuk-tuks, the solar tuk-tuks. These are all solar tuk-tuks being charged by sun. This is a system we have out here and we are charging uh, an electric vehicle here. You can see that, this one. You go to Tuvalu, the public vehicle, you know, they don't have buses, but they have these kind of vehicles. Big, you know, uh, motorcycles, which use a lot of, lot of diesel or petrol to, to, to take people around. You remove, look at Fiji, the buses, look at the smoke here. <laughs> this is a typical bus here. So all these things can be, can be, can be sorted out if you replace these things by electric vehicles. And this is not something which we are saying in jest. In fact, most of the countries, like in, in France, in India, in the UK, they have said by 2030, there will, there will not be any diesel vehicles. There will not be any petrol-driven vehicles. More, all the vehicles will be electric vehicles. In Fiji, the government has decided that uh, you, if you set up an electric vehicle charging station, then you get tax-free uh, service. So you don't have to pay any tax. So you will see in coming days, you will see many, many places you will have charging stations. But as I told you yesterday, your vehicle is as clean as your charging system. If you're charging with a generator, it is not clean. It has to be charged with renewable energy. So these two things should come together. All right? So this is, this is about my spiel about SDG and why renewable energy is important. Any questions?